what does family mean to you and personally? And how did you approach the concept of family and familial relationships, again, whether it's found or biological, um, in the book? I mean, those relationships are so formative, I think, for a lot of people. Um, I mentioned before that I have older siblings. I dedicated the book to them because we are so, we're still really, really close. But I thought it would be so fun to write a messy story about siblings. And so the Italian gang, they're not all siblings, but they're, for the most part, either related by blood or by marriage. And I just thought that was so fun to play with because when you're arguing with your siblings, you're never just arguing about the thing that happened today. You're also arguing about the one time you threw a marble and it broke the TV and you blamed your brother. And this is not a true event, but that's, that's part of the fun. There's when you've known people from the cradle, there's a certain kind of in speak and cadence and the level of in jokes that you just have with those people that I think instantly kind of draws an audience in to like want to join the party. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 75 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, my dearest train wreck, MJ Kuhn. How's it going, MJ? <laughs> I am lovely. How are you? <laughs> Doing really well. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and if you want to support MJ and her work, you can pick up Among Thieves, her debut novel, and the sequel, which MJ will show now. Thick as thieves. If you want a thieving duology in the vein of, I don't know, Greta Kelly's The Queen of Days, perhaps, you can go pick it up <laughs> and enjoy some hot heists, some hot characters doing hot shit, hatchets, and all that fun stuff. Uh, as well, a quick note for listeners the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the FanFightic YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, welcoming today's guest, the lovely Greta Kelly, author of the Warrior Witch Duology and the upcoming Queen of Days. Hello, Greta. Hello. Hello. I'm good. Thank you guys for having me. An absolute <laughs> pleasure. I'm very, very happy you're here. But uh, just to get started, for anyone who isn't familiar with you, your work, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so I'm Greta. I'm a Midwestern author. I am the mother of two tiny little chaos gremlins. <laughs> I am a D&D &D player. I love me some critical role and I write a bunch of fantasy nerd shit. Yeah, <laughs> fellow parent and fellow Midwesterner like MJ. Oh, Just yeah. All the you got this. You got this. <laughs> One main thing in common with each of us. <laughs> That's really all you need. That's right. adult friendship, really. Yeah. <laughs> just one thing. Yeah. Exactly. This is the lodestone of our relationship. I adore it. <laughs> so as a fan of nerd shit, let's dive into that a little bit. What was your relationship with reading sci-fi fantasy like growing up? Were you always into sci-fi and fantasy? Is it like a newer thing? Like as an adult that you got into? Like what's the what's the story there? No, I always had just a wild imagination. I think Part of that is because I grew up in the middle of fucking nowhere. <laughs> and so like we had to entertain ourselves and that was just the way that we lived. <laughs> um, but reading actually came a lot later for me because I'm quite dyslexic. And so it was really hard for me to learn how to read and do math and stuff like that. Um, so I was a little bit of a late bloomer in that regards. Don't ask me to do math. I'm still, <laughs> I could, I felt we, like we don't do math I could either, I could, <laughs> I could either learn to read or I could learn to do math. I chose the reading. We just, we won't look back. <laughs> a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my dad was actually, and still is like a huge voracious science fiction and fantasy reader. And so I really blame all of this on him. Um, dad. And I remember like, you know, I was, I was probably in middle school, I think when the Lord of the Rings movies came out. And he refused to take us to see, I'm the youngest of four, so us being my older siblings. Me too. Wow, so many lodestones. Jesus. 
<laughs> we were destined to be friends. No, we're, we're blonde. We're there we parents. go. We have children. What else do we need? We're good. <laughs> we're the trifecta at this point, you guys. Don't surprise me. At this point. MJ, I'm sorry. <laughs> out. Sure. Sure. I'm not invited to hang out anymore. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no but uh oh yeah lord of the rings um when those movies came out he wouldn't take any of us to see them unless we all read the books and so i kind of never looked back between those books and the movies man i was hooked <laughs> respect it's a yeah. good gateway drug yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of respect for your dad yeah that was yeah. my first vhs was uh the fellowship of the ring nice and, uh, <laughs> yeah I was just, I was just like frustrated because my mom's like, we got a bunch of shit to do after we go to the, <laughs> to the store and get your movie. So I was like, oh, that's l- cool. literally like <laughs> reading the box for an hour and a half. Man, I don't know how many times I have probably watched the forty hours of extra features on oh the Lord my gosh, of the Rings. So many set. times, right? <laughs> yeah, so formative. Oh, <laughs> okay, so when you started to read and when you got into Lord of the Rings and everything like that, how did? How did writing kind of come back into it? How did that journey progress from your board? We got nothing to do. We got to make shit up. <laughs> Midwestern days. And then what yeah. was it that made you think like, I want to write my own books? You know, I kind of had that pie in the sky dream of being an author, uh, starting even in high school, actually. And I had this really great eclectic group of friends and I mean eclectic because it made no sense that any of us were friends with each other. <laughs> like I was a I was a double varsity athlete. There was a theater kid. There was like the art kid. There were a couple of like just true burnout kids. And somehow we were all it's just like, like the best friends. We I were. was going to say, That's yeah, so you guys good. were like a, like yeah. a walking cartoon we really, network yeah, show yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like Riverdale <laughs> or Breakfast Club. <laughs> yeah. That's great, man. Yeah, Riverdale, that'd be terrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because everyone is like, yeah, there's the eclectic kind of nature, but then everyone just kind of tries to fuck each other. Yeah, we were not. Nice. We were not that incestuous, nor that good looking. But <laughs> <laughs> we did still have our own adventures. We would just like camp out at someone's house for a weekend and have what we called creative think tanks. And like whatever creative endeavor we wanted to do, we would do. Um, and then like 2004, 2005, 2006 happened. And everywhere in the world, they were talking about the death of print media. And as someone who was about to graduate high school, I basically went, well, fuck. <laughs> oh, I guess being a writer isn't going to happen. I'll just go and get myself that business degree. <laughs> uh, which, you know, I, I can't say that I regret because it let me study abroad. I, I traveled like a lot of Europe and through Asia throughout uh, college, which really was foundational in terms of my writing career. But I, I do, there is a corner of my mind that wonders like, dang it, what if I had just chosen to like take one creative writing course <laughs> in college or like chosen to believe in that dream a little bit more, but yeah, there's no point in really looking back is there. <laughs> no, but those things always, yeah, you know, it always comes full circle. Like, yeah. you know, I was, when yeah. I was younger, I was like, I want to be a writer or like comic book artist or voiceover like uh actor yeah those kinds of things and it's like you know do a bunch yeah. of shit in my 20s be a tattoo artist and then right. come back and it's like oh I'll become a podcaster and a, and a science fiction writer it's like <laughs> yeah oh, all right, cool you know so you're thing, right though yeah it, it comes full circle and it did for me too I was I you know graduated college I was working at a bank like a local bank and like my soul was slowly dying <laughs> and so I thought well if I'm going to be miserable, I may as well be miserable and create something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I was like the weird lady in the lunchroom writing in a notebook because I didn't have a laptop. So yes, I wrote the entire first draft of the frozen crown on paper oh. <laughs> and, wow. yeah. and like ignoring the rest of the world while I wrote this little book. And I did not tell anyone about it. I did not tell a single one of my coworkers that I wrote until I got an agent and they were wow. like, what? <laughs> Oh my God. I did the same thing, Greta. I didn't tell anyone except for like my very close family that I was writing yeah. until I got an agent. And then I didn't tell yeah. anyone else in my life until I got the book deal. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Why do we keep it a secret? It's so weird. Oh, it's the imposter syndrome. Yeah. It's the writing isn't like a thing that real people do. So I'm just not going to jinx it by talking about it. But also we spend so much time in our heads they find out. that we feel like, at least I feel like 
the, the stuff that goes on my head, if I told somebody else, they'd be like, you're a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> they well, exactly. find other writers and we're all crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, especially like the first few times you try to do the elevator pitch of your novel, people look at you like you're describing a boring dream. And it's like <laughs> so soul crushing. It's like, <laughs> like no, I promise it's good. <laughs> yeah. Like picture this meets that and like combined with that and then this. And it's like... Do oh, that know, means. Do you know what comps are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh Let me comp gosh. two things you've never heard of before. <laughs> That's always the challenge. Like, what is popular yeah. enough that I can comp and obscure enough that it doesn't sound like just everything else? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you drafted the Frozen Crown on paper, on paper, at least partially in your work break room. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yep. When did the Frozen Crown and the Warrior Witch duology like take shape in your mind? Did you come up with the idea? like while you were at that mind numbing job <laughs> or was it something you'd wanted to write before that yeah no it was definitely something I'd wanted to write before that I I had like the first flash of inspiration for the frozen crown probably like my senior year of college but at that point I was struggling through a different book that went absolutely nowhere because it was a hot mess and we can talk about plotting later <laughs> 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 but when I was working at that job, I'm like, you know what, now is the time I'm going to write this book that I've been like sitting on for a year and a half, and I'm just going to go for it. And so that's what happened. And I think that was probably 2017, I want to say is when I drafted the Frozen Crown and started working on it. And then it got an agent in 2018. And then early 2019 is when it sold to Harper Voyager. That's Crazy. like a fast timeline, uh-huh. honestly. Yeah, it was a pretty, like, it was that's pretty like whirlwind. a whirlwind for, I mean, I know like all oh, three years, but like, that's like a whirlwind for publishing. Yeah. <laughs> did book two, did you write that on paper as well? No, I did not. Uh, <laughs> I, that would have been kind of fun, but no, at that point, uh, no, <laughs> I knew, I knew I had <laughs> a laptop at that point. In, yeah. Like I moved my, up in the world. <laughs> yeah. My fingers are slowly curling like that one scene in Wizard of Oz with the toes. <laughs> Some oh. visual imagery there. I love yes, it. Yes. How was it? How was it going through that process though? Because it was super quick for you to kind of enter into like got an agent and Harper Voyager yeah. picking it up and just kind of like, what was your perception of traditional publishing before that? And then how did your expectations or lack of perspective yeah. meet whatever whatever you ended up experiencing? Yeah, it was such a mess. I knew, like, I knew that publishing was going to take forever, so I was kind of ready for that submission process to take like the better part of a year. So I was really surprised when it took like three months and we, we had had the deal. And then uh, they were like, it's going to be, here's what we're, here's what we're doing. We're going to make it two books and they're both going to be released in the same year and it's going to be 2021. And so this was back in like January of 2019. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's enough time to write a second book. I have figure out what it's going to be then. <laughs> um, but then like the weight ended up being like, Oh, can it just be 2021 yet? Like, yeah. Please, what like, happened? Just like, just like release book one in 2020. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, global pandemic later. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. ended up being the like weirdest time to release not one, but two books. Um, but yeah, that, that happened to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> no, but I can imagine, you know, 2021 was obviously better than 2020. Right. Um but, but it was January 2021, so it was, yeah, like it was pretty winter early. in the Midwest, and people, at least around me, still weren't really, like, getting out. Not that I was going to have a launch party anyway, because uh, my second child was born the day after the Frozen Crown released. Wow. So, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I was alive. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what was my favorite? I was on the Fictitious podcast um, with Adrian Busky, like, two weeks before I gave birth and my husband was in the corner the entire time, like waiting for me to like wow. pop off. Just, just go into it was labor. Just, yeah. did, you give him a head, did you give him a heads up that it's like, I'm very pregnant and I might have I to. Did. Uh, <laughs> I did. Like here, here's the deal. I'm yeah. a live grenade at the moment. I'm yeah. sorry if I have to leave to have, have a child. It's just going to happen. Yeah. That was like with, the, with Chuck Wendig. Oh. We, we had a, uh, a recording booked with him when my wife was pregnant with my second son. And then, yeah. and then <laughs> it was like, Hey, just messaged him. You know, we're going to have to Sorry. postpone. <laughs> he was super cool about it, but it was yeah. like, fingers crossed this, you know, we can make this work. Yeah. Out. And he was like, yeah. oh, man, don't worry, don't worry about it. 
Oh my gosh. So, well, I was I was relieved too because the alternative was I was gonna have to do my very first solo yeah. interview with yeah. like an author I'm an, an extreme fangirl for. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet it would have been great because he seems like so personable. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah totally yeah. would have been fine. But, but was stressed out. It's more MJ <laughs> than Chuck. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He totally would never have been the issue. <laughs> Let's be clear about that. <laughs> he sent me the like cutest reply. I sent him a picture of the baby and he was like, little human. That was all he said. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're the best. You're the best. That's great though. Cause yeah, I mean, I mean, I imagine like, obviously for MJ, you and Greta both debuted in the same year, but mm-hmm. on top of it, it's like, we're going to launch both books and we're going to do a rapid release. Yeah. Had you, had you ever heard of that happening before no what was your what was your what was your response when harper suggested that yeah like well like it seemed like such a good idea at the time and i do think it is still a good idea and it seems the way that publishing is going to be moving more towards especially in the adult sphere um but i think because i had so much time to like draft that second book and get it complete it was probably the most relaxing second book that anyone has ever had to second book (laughs) <laughs> because I like a lot of times authors will come out with their first book and then have a year or two to make the second one. And in the meantime, they're reading all their reviews. They're getting all the feedback. They're getting all of that like second book anxiety. While Whereas waiting. I was just drafting. Yeah. yeah. In complete isolation. No one really expected anything out of me except for my editor and my agent. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's I had the you same, I, mean, I wasn't under contract for it, but I feel like I had a similar yeah. experience too. And when I hear people talk about trying to draft it the other way, I'm like, Ooh, God yeah. Bad that that. <laughs> yeah. I honestly like bullet dodged because it was already hard enough to have a book come out in the pandemic. I could not imagine have to do that and then turn around and write the second book in that series. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just with the pressure, man. It's crazy. It's like, oh, fucking sales numbers, reviews. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Well, okay. Well, so you had your experience at rapid release uh, mm-hmm. with the Warrior Witch duology. You got to really yeah. live and sink into that world for a really long mm-hmm. time. Uh, how did it feel or does it feel uh, starting something new with Queen of Days? Because and I'm kind of curious, when did you write the Queen of Days? Uh, was it before either? Because I think we talked yeah. about this a little bit uh off record <laughs> makes it sound so, <laughs> so, so, so right. but, <laughs> you know I, i'm curious when you wrote it and then how does it feel kind of launching into a whole new world um yeah accidental disney quote um with <laughs> <laughs> with the queen of days you're yes. on fire Anja. i love this <laughs> thank you Just keep this going, is what happens when we record not in the middle of the night <laughs> MJ's fucking fired up, baby. <laughs> energy. <laughs> oh, man. Afternoon. So, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I wrote the first draft of The Queen of Days while I was still on submission with The Frozen Crown. So it was 2018. It was a NaNoWriMo project. And it was absolutely the book I was writing to get my mind off of being on submission with The Frozen Crown and knowing that in traditional publishing, at least, it is a dumb idea to spend any time writing the second book in a series without knowing if those books are going to get picked up. So The Queen of Days was absolutely a palate cleanser book. It was completely different in tone from The Frozen Crown, completely different like stakes and characters and world. And so it was really, it was a great time. It was probably the most fun I have ever had dra- drafting a book. <laughs> oh, that's great. Can you give I everyone a bit that. of a I sales do- pitch? Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like a lot of times the best books are when we are using them as therapy. Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are your comps? What are your comps, Greta? Yeah, but tell us, what, what, about you, what are your comps for Queen of Days? Give us a sales pitch. Sell Obviously, the comps are Among Thieves and Lies of Lock Lamora <laughs> and Six of Crows. Uh, but it is about a crew of thieves who team up with a time-eating demon to steal an ancient statue from their city's governor before he can resurrect a vengeful god. And literally fail at every turn along the way. <laughs> In the most delightful ways. Yeah. That's the best. They that's are the best. my chaos yeah. babies. They are lovable chaos babies. And I'm obsessed with them. Oh my God. You have your fictional chaos babies and then you have your literal chaos babies. Yeah. <laughs> Little did I know. Mm-hmm. Just a few short years later. <laughs> Why can't you pull a heist? Why are you shitting your pants? <laughs> <laughs> How do I tell their 
at least like four or five to start planning the next thing, Jane. Come on. Lorelai, I cannot believe you have not designed a zip gun yet. (laughs) (laughs) It's like failing my expectations over and over. (laughs) Parenting MJ, parenting. (laughs) Okay. Um, So you mentioned uh, Time Demon, um, Mm -hmm. which I really love this character. The the titular Queen of Days. Let's dig a little bit deeper and let's talk time. So why was time yes. one of the major kind of ideas and, and conceits that you chose to play with in this book? Yeah. So this book is obviously a conglomeration of a lot of things that I love, not just D&D, but like Firefly, the TV show and, and Serenity, the movie, but also Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, I have this particular soft spot for the uh, tenant years of Doctor Who when they introduced the Weeping Angels. And like the conceit behind the Weeping Angels is that, first of all, they, they can't move if you're looking at them. And if they catch you, they don't necessarily kill you, but they will take you back in time and then feed on the energy of the life that you should have lived. And I just thought this was the coolest fucking idea of like using time as a commodity, as something that powers impossible things and having that be assigned to beings that do not experience time. And when you can't experience time, then how precious must it be? to like see people actually living a life Mm -hmm. and forgetting about things and forgetting about (laughs) things. (laughs) Yes. Forgetting is a gift that these Tassiel's people, the queen of days do not have. They remember everything as if it happened to them two minutes ago. And I don't think people realize when they talk about immortality, what a weight that must be. Like there is no relief. If you are always young, you are always vital. You have no excuse not to wreak havoc and and claim your vengeance and always be striving. Like where's the time just to like Mm -hmm. relax (laughs) and and introspect and, you know, actually gain the wisdom of all those age. You're just constantly embittered. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You never get to be the crazy old person. (laughs) That's a gift, people. (laughs) When everyone just says like, oh, don't worry about like Grandma Greta. She just doesn't remember shit. (laughs) They can never look forward to that. Poor Tess. You know, I am looking forward to that. I feel like I'm aging into my personality and it's going to be awesome. (laughs) Very much same. (laughs) So how did you go about creating a whole magic system using time as that locus of power? Let's dig a little more into like... Ooh, but we don't want to spoil anything, I know. But like, you know, what can, what can you tell us? <laughs> well, I think it's mostly summed up in chapter one, which the excerpt has been released. I think it's on tour. So you can go check it out. It's not a huge spoiler. But in Tassiel's case, um, she is a criminal for hire. And if you retain her services, she's not going to take any cut of the, you know, the take. But she is going to take 30 days of your life. So you will die if you work with her 30 days before creation intended it. And she will take that energy and she has a way of storing it. And it's like what powers, what people assume is magic and just like the crazy things that she's able to do with all that power. So, yeah. So cool. (laughs) Yeah, I really loved it. And uh, (laughs) I'm also so glad to hear that, that Doctor Who was the inspiration behind this. Because when you yeah. when you were like Doctor Who, I was like Weeping Angels, Weeping Angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. So cool. uh, and it's cool that that you were able to kind of twist it into your own world in a way yeah. that felt really, really natural, but also like a nice nod to yeah to so a, a nod to something that I like. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of also like refreshing. In in the Frozen Crown, the magic system is much more defined. There's much more like rigid rules to it. I was able to get by with more of a soft kind of magic system in the in the Queen of Days, simply because there's so few characters who are even able to use it. So it was always kind of this this outlier in the world, especially in a world where it you know the idea of gods kind of fell out of vogue a hundred years ago, and no one really believes in magic anymore. And yeah, so it all kind of folded nicely into this you know revolutionary world, like us today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gods and magic are out of work. <laughs> but we get it in a fantasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we mentioned heists uh, a few mm-hmm. times already. And I thought you crafted a really, really awesome heist in this book. But what Thank do you, you personally love about heists 
And why did you choose one for the Queen of Days? And how did yeah. how did you kind of use what we talked about in terms of time, in terms of Tassiel and her her magic abilities? Mm -hmm. How did you kind of build that into into the heist? Yeah, well, it's all baked right in there. I think mm -hmm. one of the most exciting things about heists is the idea of failure. I think it's also one of the most exciting things about gambling. If you think about like any kind of risk taking, it's not the risk itself. It's the possibility that it could all go terribly wrong. <laughs> and so that's always what has like drawn me towards heist ideas. And it just seemed so natural. If you're having a group of like vagabonds get together to do the thing, it has to be a heist. <laughs> <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Well, let's dive into our vagabonds. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about your crew, your characters, yeah. how they take shape. Let's talk about the world that they live in. Um, and then also, <laughs> did you create the world first? Did you create the characters first? Let's dive into all of that good, fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, the characters definitely came first. Um, I think that's one of like the secrets of getting through a NaNoWriMo project if you're writing a novel in a month <laughs> is that you don't worry about world building. Just get the plot out. Just vomit the plot out and you'll get your, <laughs> your 50,000 words in November. Um, so yeah, character definitely came first. Um, yeah, it's so wrapped up in like D and D because the seed of the queen of days came from a, a game of D and D I played with my nerdy ass friends. <laughs> um, and I don't even remember exactly what we were trying to steal, but we were robbing a bank. And literally, from the moment we entered, everything that could have possibly gone wrong did. <laughs> like, we got made immediately. We couldn't find the vault. Once we found the vault, we couldn't open the door because that's the real enemy in any D&D yeah. &D campaign. <laughs> so we couldn't find the way out. Someone set a fire, maybe intentionally. Who knows? Like, it was a disaster. But it was also, like, the most fun any of us had ever had to that point playing a game. And I just remember like driving home that night thinking, damn, if I could figure out a way to distill that feeling into a book, it'd be fucking amazing. And so I just kind of ran with that D&D &D feel and like came out with my, I knew like Balthazar was going to be the main character. And so I made like a D&D &D character sheet for him. And I did the same thing for all of the other like <laughs> characters in the Italian gang to kind of like get an idea about what they'd be good at as well as what they're bad at. And for me, it's the what they're bad at. That's always the most compelling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because that, yeah. that <laughs> that's what fuels the fuck ups and that's what fuels the tension. Exactly. That's what makes it fun. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that's so well, and just like quick plug for your Instagram, uh, you have a uh, character art of the Talian gang, which I by do. the time of airing, I think all of them should be revealed. Yeah, that's at right. At this time, only about mm -hmm. half of them, I think, are revealed. As, yeah. <laughs> as of recording. Um, as of right yeah, now. <laughs> see Speaking of what time, Italian we're gang look like. <laughs> Head on over to Greta's yes. Instagram and take a look. <laughs> Art by the amazing Alice Maria Power. Go check her out. She's amazing. <laughs> plug, plug. But yeah, they're my little gremlins. They're the best. <laughs> Love but, it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. And so you mentioned you mentioned Tassiel and like the the gods. And mm -hmm. it's kind of cool in this book how there's kind of like a dual perception of you have a POV yeah. character who is one of these people and then you have yeah. human characters who are, you know, baked into their culture, baked into their history is this idea of what these, this other race is. So how did you yeah. go, how did you go about writing these, you could even call them time gods. Or yeah. Just, just bitter, <laughs> these other bitter beings. Demons. Yeah. Yeah. Such that they felt like, <laughs> such that they felt like real people because they actually felt like real people, but also, you know, they're supernatural beings and yeah. Kind of <laughs> um, so I I love me some mythology. And I was I must have been watching some kind of documentary on like the ancient Greek city states and how while well, the people who lived there obviously worshipped all of the gods as they saw fit, it always struck me as funny that you would have some city states that were just like dedicated to the one God. <laughs> to the yeah. Point, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. we're going to make this great temple. We're going to fill it with gold and food and virgins and whatever. And it's just going to be great. <laughs> Psychedelics and all that fun. <laughs> yeah. <shit. laughs> but, but what if the gods actually arrived? Like, is that really the game plan? Is this, is this really what you want? You want your God of war to like appear one day and you think that's going to end up well for you. <laughs> and So that's kind of, especially the Greek gods. Cause they were always like told stories. So freaking capricious. 
So it was that sort of, you know, instead of going the ethereal elf route to my immortals, I took the garbage fire terminally bored monster <laughs> sort of <laughs> approach. <laughs> And we thank you for it. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, as they say, if someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. <laughs> sure. Virgin. Virgin. Yeah. Virgins. You know what? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, another big aspect in the Queen of Days, uh, if we're, you know, still talking about characters, is family. I feel like family, whether it's. Yeah found or biological uh mm-hmm. there's a, a lovely mix of all of it um yeah. in, in the queen of days um so i feel like what is what does family mean to you and personally and how did you approach the concept of family and familiar relationships again whether it's found or biological um yeah you know? i mean those relationships are so formative i think for a lot of people um i mentioned before that i have older siblings i dedicated the book to them because we are so we're still really really close but I thought it would be so fun to write a messy story about siblings. And so the Italian gang, they're not all siblings, but they're for the most part, either related by blood or by marriage. And I just thought that was so fun to play with because when you're arguing with your siblings, you're never just arguing about the thing that happened today. You're (laughs) also arguing about the one time you threw a marble and it broke the TV and you blamed your brother. And this is not a true event, (laughs) but (laughs) no, it doesn't sound specific enough to be true at all. (laughs) No, (laughs) allegedly. (laughs) Just some hypotheticals. But that's, that's part of the fun. There's when you've known people from the cradle, there's a certain kind of in speak and cadence and the level of in jokes that you just have with those people that I think instantly kind of draws an audience in to like want to join the party. And then adding that found family aspect to it is really tassial. She didn't, she, no one wanted her to join the gang, really. <laughs> but she's here. Yeah. She's here and, and her real not even, yeah. <laughs> and not even she, she, like at the beginning of the story, And part of the reason that she's written in third person rather than first person like Val is, is because even she is so far in denial that she wants to belong to something and that she wants people that she can't even articulate it to herself. And I think we've all felt that longing at one point or another. I mean, we were joking about how how easy it is to make adult friends. It's really not. (laughs) It's so hard to make adult friends. And I think we've all felt that like, like we're at sea and completely alone, even when we're in rooms full of people and uh, getting to be like brought into the fold is such like a visceral feeling that so many people crave. But I think it's part of the reason that found family stories are so timeless. Mm -hmm. And she's so awkward about it. It's wonderful. (laughs) And I love it. (laughs) She's a demon with a heart of gold. (laughs) She is though. You just want to give her a hug. Like that's yeah. I just want to give her a hug. <laughs> like even when you know, because obviously the way that you talked about with like the in jokes and everything of of biological yeah. family or friends who have been f- have been together for a really long time, mm-hmm. being an outsider and kind of experience that is a really jarring thing. Yeah, you're really like I don't know what the hell is going on. I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I feel really lost. And Tassie yeah. feels lost enough already. All the time, yeah. And she's just like, God, these little fucking punks, these turds, what are they talking about? <laughs> I understand the words you were saying, just not in the combination you were using them. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then there's also like the language barrier where she's like not speaking her native language. So it's all Yeah, super yeah. And it's like even though she's been in this world for however many decades at this point, in her mind, she's still using her native language mm-hmm. because that's how isolated she's been. You actually yeah. had like there's one moment in the book where you're like speaking you were giving her dialogue but then you're kind of mm-hmm. giving some internalization where she was like i can't even like think of the right word yeah or, you know she's kind of like in this translation jumble in her head i'm like man i've yeah. experienced that so many times and you captured it beautifully so. yeah <laughs> that's part of the one of the perks of having traveled abroad i studied yeah. spent a semester in germany and damn that translation jumble it's real bad <laughs> I lived, in, I lived in Berlin for three years and like, I can listen to German and understand stuff, but I cannot speak uh, it worth a damn. Yeah. 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 MJ, you even went to Germany too. So it's like, 
Yeah. You know what it's all about. <gasps> Another <laughs> lodestone. <Yes. laughs> oh, we're just racking them up. We're just we're just gonna add. I'm gonna start a Venn diagram. I will yes. send it to you later. <laughs> we'll make sure. <laughs> no, we need a three-way Venn diagram though. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. We'll make sure. We'll see where we all <laughs> where we all fall. Okay. Do you have any found family like any favorite found family tropes? Or examples of found families in fiction. You already mentioned Firefly, which is like yeah, beautiful. love Firefly. Um, already mentioned Liza Lacklamora. I love that book. Same with Six of Crows. God, there's just so many that all of them are evaporating from my brain. But any, yeah, any tropes <laughs> that you really like? <laughs> oh gosh, I can't think of one found family specific. I don't know. What do you think, MJ? You wrote a big found family book. I know. See, that's not the fun thing about when you're asked to list your favorite of anything. I'm always like I'm looking back at my book well, just, like, I have I have one that relates to both of yours, which is the found family double cross. I love it when I love it oh, when for the, trope. Yeah. Like the trope yeah. of like the found family being like fractured is always so good. And then it's like yeah. things come back together and you're like, yes, friendship and family and all this <laughs> yes. stuff. Friendship <laughs> wins. The heist was the friends we made along the way. Exactly. The they stole each friendship. other's hearts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess like the one, one thing I did go in thinking about was the idea of platonic best friends or platonic soulmates mm. in yes. terms of found families. And I feel like, you know, people are going to do with characters what they will, but at least in my mind, Tassiel and Val are like, the platonic best friends of my dreams. Yep. <laughs> and it's like, there's not even like a will they, won't they kind of thing. It's yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> like, just, no. I want to see like a, like a <laughs> spinoff novella, like buddy cop kind of shit with them. <laughs> right. Be That'd be hilarious. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> I did have an idea that maybe someday I would write a buddy cop, like homeward bound sort of Ooh. adventure story about Mira and Tassiel's brother, Callion. Ooh. <laughs> Because I, I just like think it. there would be something funny to to redeem about that little trickster character. Nice. I like it. Okay, well, I have a particular favorite found family, uh, and it's what's uh, that? You and MJ and Genevieve and <laughs> Hannah and all these wonderful writers that somehow found each other. Um, and it's been really cool to like meet Hannah and then meet Genevieve and become better and better friends with with MJ yeah. and just like guys have your like cute little gang and and. I just I think it would be nice for listeners to hear about how you two met and how you kind of became part of the I don't even yeah. you, don't, you don't have a name or anything. You're not like the Italian gang, but you could no. just make a name. You should make a name. That's a <laughs> I, I, I've been like secretly vouching for that, but I'm not gonna interject. <laughs> like I've been waiting for you guys to figure out that you need a name. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you that's how you reach peak squad goals, people. Exactly. <laughs> No, it was like the one bright spot in 2020 was finding the 2021 traditional author debut group on Facebook. The only good thing that has ever happened on Facebook. (laughs) And then like finding the subset of authors there that were the sci-fi and fantasy people. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And it like by luck, a lot of us are in the Midwest. I think Hannah's the outlier. Um, I mean, she's in Ontario. So it's like Midwest Canada. Midwest Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Same kind of thing. time zone almost, at least. Yeah. yeah. But, but because we're so close, like, we've been able to go to each other's events and, like, become friends in real life. And MJ and I finally just met in person at uh, Rose City Comic Con in Portland. Ironically, all the way across the country from the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you know, you're doing the launch event we, together as well. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She's going to come up and do my launch event here in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is where I'm from. Um, and, the yeah, it's going to be great. Kenosha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it's very cute, actually. It is. So, yeah. And not even just from Greta. Like, I'm, I'm heard it from other people. I'm Genevieve, too. <laughs> right. Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that, though. But, yeah. Y'all need to come great. up with a name. Seriously, you need to we come do. up with a name at this point. Well, we've been throwing out the idea of doing, uh, like, an author writing retreat sometime next year. So I think if that ever actually takes form. At Hannah's cat. A name. will Ooh. ooh. Ooh, I didn't even think about that. I volunteer her as tribute. Right? <laughs> Hannah will be watching this episode like, Sorry, uh, excuse me? She's like, yeah, you guys can bring tents this. and, you can bring tents and fucking camp out in my, like, yeah. massive party. <laughs> I kind of love it, I would be fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, no, it'll be like, it'll be like the, what, you friends, what you and your friends did when you were younger. It's like you do a weekend camp out and you'll have, like, yes. a creative think tank. That's right. It's perfect. That's right. 
<laughs> Full fucking Be like high circle. school vibes. That's Hopefully right. high school vibes for you, not high school vibes for me because I didn't have <laughs> I think we should all move past high school vibes at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, please. Oh, my God. Well, speaking of moving past and looking ahead, oh, look at that transition, Adrian. I'm nailing it. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what else you have in the works. You kind of teased that you have another idea for a possible maybe novella or something in the world of the Queen of Days. Do you have other stories that you plan to tell in the world of the Queen of Days? What's next? Not yet. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, there's no point in working on something if you're not sure if you're going to get paid for it. <laughs> what <a> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I do have another story that's ready to go to my editor at any moment. So who knows if it's already there by the time this, this episode airs. Um, so annoyingly, I cannot say anything about it other than it's a fun murder mystery. Ooh. <laughs> you it's a came, fantasy. You should have joined Josiah. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, right. I was listening to that to that episode with great interest. <laughs> <laughs> I like it though. Is it? Is yeah. it? Can you even tease like if it's a separate world or separate world? Okay. Uh, the the little one sentence elevator pitch is that it's about a girl who can't die who has to solve her own murder. Nice. Okay, <laughs> that's why when you said murder mystery, yeah. I made this face because you were telling me about it the other day. Yeah, <laughs> it's that one. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> And then I'm also uh, drafting something completely new. So it's way too early to talk about it, but I'm having a great time drafting it. So that's usually a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> You're having fun. That's the most yeah. important thing. <laughs> and now for some, some mind benders, because apparently okay. this is the shit that stumps people every time. Um, <laughs> to close out, if you could give listeners and viewers, A, a good bit of soundbite writing advice, and B, tell us a weird or random fact that you find to be utterly fascinating. Okay. Um, writing advice. That'll be easy. I have a million pieces of writing advice. Um, keeping on the theme of time. <laughs> Once you have finished your first draft, walk the fuck away from it. <laughs> you will not be able to read it with an objective eye until you have spent some time away. So walk away, spend like a month doing something else, visiting those friends you've been ignoring. And then when you come back, read the book front to start to finish before you make any changes. Because if you dive in and make changes right away, what will inevitably end up happening is you'll spend two months making the first three chapters fucking pristine and then find something in chapter four that means you have to blow up those entire perfect chapters and <laughs> start over. <laughs> so be patient. It's good advice. Love it. Um, and then, oh God, what's my Roman Empire? Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's the hot shit right now. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> Um, uh, probably with linguistics, I had this class in college. I don't even remember what it was actually about, but we probably spent at least a month just talking about how languages are formed and how they relate to one another and how they evolve over time. And aside from the fact that Hungarian is related to literally no other language in the world, even though they're completely landlocked and have been surrounded by vastly more powerful empires, there is the fact that English, as we know it now, has really just been a bunch of different software updates of different forms of German <laughs> from, you know, the Angles, the Danes, the Saxons, the Vikings. And then all of a sudden the Normans came and introduced French. And so if you think about it, English is really just Frenchified German. And so the next time <laughs> you are saying to yourself, I before E, my lily white ass, you can blame <laughs> English for making no sense because it's just Frenchified German and that makes no sense at all. I love it. <laughs> I adore it. Also, that fact about Hungarian is very fascinating because yeah. like, <laughs> we talked to, uh, we talked yeah, to uh, Ronnie Verdi and he said to us that it was like out of all like the languages in the world, the ones that like that is most closely linked to like Lithuanian for some reason is mm -hmm. Sanskrit. So there's just like all these yeah. like, crazy things. About it just makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But I love it. It's and a I, mystery. Yeah. French if I <laughs> And then you, yeah. then you like bring French over to Canada and then. And yeah. then you go back to France and nobody wants to speak it with you because they think you sound like a fool. And I'm like, oh, what no. happened? what's wrong with my Canadian French, huh? <laughs> Just personal gripes, you know? <laughs> Not that Adrian is speaking from experience on this one at no. all. Yeah, yeah. No. This is totally. like the Marvel in the TV story. That's right. There's no That's way right. that like, this have, is real. What you got Completely wrong apocryphal. With my Quebecois, man. Like, what's wrong with my Quebecois? <laughs> Don't mean it. Nothing at all. It's beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Greta, thank you so much for hanging out with MJ and I. It was an <laughs> thank delight. you for having me. Um, as well, for anyone who contributes to our Patreon at $10 or more a month, there will be an exclusive reading by Greta from the Queen of Days. So go check that out. 
And Greta, if you could please let everyone know where they can find you online. Yes, I am on Instagram, TikTok, and on X, waiting for the heat death of that platform, at <laughs> Greta K. Kelly. <laughs> I'm most active over on Instagram. Um, but yeah, come come check out. Join the fun. I talk yes. a lot about D&D and Critical Role, so just be ready for that. Right <laughs> and go pre-order The Queen of Days, which is out on October 24th. October 24th. Yeah, day after my birthday. Ooh, happy, happy birthday. birthday <laughs> yeah. And you used heat death. You just listened to the episode with Josiah and that definitely got stuck in your head. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, X, that shit, and threads at SFF Addicts Pod. Or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me on pretty much all the socials at MJ Coon Books. Or you can go to my website, mjkuhn.com, and you can sign up for my newsletter and get a free novelette. Bah, bah, bah. Woo, the sham wizard of Golden Dawn, baby. Yes. <laughs> also inspired by D&D. <laughs> <laughs> yes, adding it to the Venn diagram. And... <laughs> go pick up Among Thieves. I'm going to do some little like twinkly fingers over here. You can go support MJ's books. Go pick them up. Have fun. <laughs> You'll love it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned next week for two, part two with Greta for our mini masterclass on plotting 101. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts.